Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Noni Hazelhurst and it's my great honour and pleasure to host the 2021 Stella Prize Award Night. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet from wherever we may be and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm talking to you from Tambourine Mountain where it's been raining for about two weeks and I was flooded out of my house recently and uh, it's really lovely to have something like this, something joyous to focus on and to distract me. Since 2013, the Stella Prize has become a major fixture in Australia's literary culture. Tonight is the ninth year that the Stella Prize has been awarded. Winning the Stella Prize is a life-changing experience for a writer in more ways than one. Tonight's winner will be awarded $50,000, affording them precious time to write. The distinctive lime green Stella sticker that is so instantly recognisable will be on each of the shortlisted book's covers now. Winning the prize increases an author's book sales exponentially, and each year the awards deliver a reading list of the very best in Australian women's writing. Tonight, and every night, we celebrate the power of women's voices and the value of storytelling in all its forms, through beautiful prose, investigative journalism, academic research, personal essays, and songwriting. Each of this year's shortlisted authors will reflect for us on voices heard and unheard in their own fictional and investigative works, and also on our responsibility as readers to listen and to absorb. Whether it's the silenced stories of victims, the coded language of animals, or the forgotten figures of history, if they could talk, what might they say? The great writers write to serve humanity, and my job as an actor is to serve the great writers. What we all want and need is connection, and the function of the arts and especially literature, is to help us feel connected, to walk a mile in another's shoes, and to understand that we're not alone. I love stories about struggle, and particularly struggles endured by women. They're the ones that remind me that we share more similarities than differences. We're all struggling, and to acknowledge that is to connect to our fellow human beings and to nature. We're all ordinary and vulnerable. And the great writers allow us to reflect on our struggles and on our choices. We're so glad that you've joined us for this celebration of great writing, which is reaching people all around the country and internationally. To join in the conversation online, remember to use the hashtag 2021 Stella Prize. To commence the official proceedings, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jacqueline Booten, Executive Director of Stella, to say a few words. Jacqueline. Thank you, Noni. We're so delighted to have one of Australia's most beloved and respected storytellers hosting this announcement. And we couldn't be more grateful for your support and advocacy for Australian artists over the last 12 months. The annual Stella Prize showcases outstanding Australian women's writing and year on year, we're delighted to add another 12 books to the ever-expanding Stella Bookshelf. This last year saw 160 entries and the 2021 Stella judges devoted hundreds of hours to reading books, discussing them and coming to the difficult task of selecting six original, excellent and engaging works. Thank you to our chair, Zoya Patel, and our judges, Jane Harrison, Elizabeth McCarthy, Ian C and Tamara Zimmet. As Noni said, tonight's winner will receive $50,000 in prize money, thanks to the generous support of our award partner, the Wilson Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce Kirsten Ross from the Foundation to say a few words now. Good evening. Over the last year, the voices and stories of many more courageous Australian women are now finally being heard. The Stella Prize's role in showcasing and celebrating 
the vast talent and stories of our authors has never been more significant. The Wilson Foundation feels privileged to continue its support of the Stella Prize. Stella's impact is collective and there are many other people we'd like to thank. Uh, these are our partners and donors and supporters who have made the Stella Prize a success every year, including the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund and the Trawala Foundation, as well as our patron supporters, Ellen Koshland, our founding patron, and the McLean Foundation, Joanna Bavesky, and the Beverly Shelton Estate. I'd also like to thank and congratulate the six shortlistees who you'll be hearing from shortly and express my gratitude to Amy Tunick, who'll be delivering tonight's stellar address. And I'm particularly pleased that Emma Donovan and the Putbacks will be closing out the celebration by performing a song from the late Ruby Hunter. I wanna thank them, the band and Emma, as well as Delivered Live, which is an incredible initiative supporting the Australian music industry with virtual gigs. So it was just over a year ago that the way we gather and celebrate changed so suddenly, and we've all seen the dramatic effects that this has had on the arts and cultural sector. It is not easy to make a living as a writer in Australia, and the barriers and challenges that women and non-binary writers face have been compounded by the effects of the pandemic in ways that will have long-standing implications. It's in this context that Stella is proud to support our 2021 writers with prize money at all stages of the process and with other creative opportunities. We hope to ensure that books by women and non-binary writers are being written, are read, and are widely valued and celebrated in this country. Finally, I wanna thank everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, many of you made a donation when you booked your ticket and we are very grateful for that support. Stella relies on the contributions from our wide community of donors and partners and the support of booksellers, libraries, educators, publishers, researchers and writers from around the country. There are myriad ways you can support Stella's efforts towards creating a more equitable national culture. To make a donation or to volunteer or to assist in other ways, please visit our website. That's it from me. On behalf of the board and the team at Stella, I hope you enjoy the announcement uh, and I look forward to celebrating the 2021 Stella Prize winning book with you in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. The lack of government support for the arts over the past year has had a catastrophic impact on tens of thousands of people. And there is still a perception out there that we arts workers somehow only work part time, that we don't have a real job. Are you kidding me? Being a writer, an actor, an artist, a director, a singer or a dancer is in my view a 24-7 job. Every minute of every day we are focused on our ability to find and tell a worthwhile story well and how best to communicate that story. I salute writers with all my heart. You have to be incredibly brave and thick-skinned to survive and we must do all we can to promote your labours of love. The benefits of being exposed to and involved in the arts are well documented and undeniable, but we have to fight very hard to have a seat at the table. Six writers who have well and truly earned their seats are our shortlisted authors. The 2021 Stella Prize shortlist is Fathoms, The World in the Whale by Rebecca Giggs, published by Scribe. Revenge, Murder in Three Parts, by S. L. Lim, published by Transit Lounge. The Animals in That Country, by Laura Jean McKay, published by Scribe. Witness, by Louise Milligan, published by Hachette Australia. Stone Sky Gold Mountain by Mirandi Ruo, published by the University of Queensland Press. And The Bass Rock by Evie Wilde, published by Penguin Random House. 
Before we hear from our shortlisted authors, I'm thrilled to introduce our special guest, Amy Tunick. Amy is a Gomoroi woman, writer and academic in the Department of Educational Studies at Macquarie University, where she's also undertaking a PhD in education with a focus on sovereign slash indigenous women in academia. In 2019, Amy gave her TEDx talk, Disruption is not a dirty word. Tonight, Amy extends her thinking around disruption to look at the way the stories are shared and shaped, heard or unheard. It's now time to hear from Amy. Yama, Maya Amy Tunig, Gamilare Inar. Hello, I'm Amy Tunig. I'm a Gomori woman, and I begin by acknowledging that today I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, my own elders past and present, and I extend my respect and care to each of the lands that you may be viewing this stream from. Wherever you are on this continent commonly referred to as Australia, you are on Aboriginal land. Always was, always will be. Storytelling is a significant way of growing a community, of building up accomplices and solidarity. And while it is through information we might come to know, it is through storying we might come to understand. We have seen time and time again, but especially during this global pandemic, the immense value of storytelling and how fitting it is that we would come together for an event such as this, in a time such as now, on the lands of the oldest continuous cultures of the world. Receiving a prize such as the Stella creates space and time for an author and is a gift to those of us who may then benefit from their story. It reminds us to question, what does the story of our own lives and that which we consume read like? It prompts us to consider the power of asking, whose story are we listening to? I would invite everyone viewing this event to be conscious of your power, power to disrupt and affect change. Our worlds, figurative, literal, physical, emotional, are made up of billions of small decisions and battles and stories. So consider disrupting. Disrupt your boardrooms. Disrupt your bookshelves. Disrupt a culture which devalues creativity and storytelling. Engage in conscious curation and citation and invest in the artists, authors and writers who are waiting to blow us away. On that note, I would like to congratulate all the shortlisted authors Writing and producing a book is not easy, and being shortlisted this evening is a huge accomplishment. Well done. I am currently writing my thesis, while also writing my first book, Tell Me Again, a series of stories from my own childhood, which will be published with UQP in 2022. It was just before COVID hit that initial discussions with my publisher began, and in the midst of the pandemic and lockdown, I signed my book contract. 2020 was a year of deep reflection for many of us, and for me, forced lockdown became a period of evaluating and re-evaluating dreams, goals, and desires. I was stuck in one place, thinking about going forward, and it had me looking back, reflecting on where I'd come from, and where as a kid, I'd hoped one day to be. I grew up poor. I'm first in family to be able to finish high school. And growing up, I didn't even know what an academic was, let alone have the capacity of dreaming of becoming one. But I grew up under a mother who used our linen closet to store her hundreds of books and a father who kept a small library next to the toilet. Through their role modelling and the excellent escape that books provide, I became a passionate reader who often dreamed of one day being a published author. In the spirit of sharing our stories, honouring those who are storytellers and have the courage to write and of learning from one another, I would like to end by reading a short extract from the introduction of my book titled Value. This piece reflects on the power of family, love and community when growing up in my household, which from the outside might have been judged and spoken of as being broken or dysfunctional. In a world where myself and my family, as Indigenous peoples, as people living in poverty, as incarcerated people and as people struggling with addiction, may have been considered voiceless, I assert that we have and always had voice it is really just a matter of whether or not people are willing to listen and hear what it is we might have to say. You will be told that a person's worth is either whole or non-existent, that a nature and existence is singular, but lives and hearts and characters are multifaceted. 
And while it would perhaps be most comforting for me to say that I only learnt what not to do through this home and these parents, that would be unfair and dishonest. The same people who in clear ways failed me, who struggled with their addiction only to repeatedly succumb, also built me up and taught me the lessons and qualities which have led to my success. I am of them. I was the worst kind of child for people with these struggles. I never understood when to keep quiet. I regularly did my best to sabotage the acts I disagreed with, hiding, ripping up and flushing. I had demands, the demands of childhood and growth, and I made them of people already in a state of overwhelm. In the midst of the fights, they were bound to fight, the choices they did and did not make. They tried, and they tried consistently. A note written before the sun came up. I see you in my 12-year-old mind's eye as I hold the scrap of paper in my hand, marked with the rim of your coffee cup. You sat here and wrote this to me while having coffee, packing the esky and leaving for work. Time looped to speak in handwriting what time and face wouldn't allow to be uttered. It is better to die standing than to live life on your knees. And so, although you struggled, and we struggled as a family, you wrote these lessons on paper, in my heart, in my mind, and I was blessed to be born into a family and community ancient and filled with love, even amidst brokenness. There is power in story, and in telling mine and ours, I hope to humanise that which is too often dehumanised and highlight that which is too often erased. There is hope, but even without change, a person's value is inherent. Thank you, Amy. What a great address from a brilliant young woman. The power of stories and art to sustain us has never been more important. Make sure to look out for Amy's forthcoming book, Tell Me Again, in bookstores next year. Well, it's now time to hear from each of our shortlisted authors on this evening's theme, if they could talk on voice and voicelessness. Mirandi Rewo's novel, Stone Sky, Gold Mountain, tells the story of two siblings who flee their home in China to seek their fortunes on the Australian goldfields in the late 19th century. We asked Mirandi to discuss some of the ways migrants were denied their full humanity during this period of Australia's history. I guess when I write my historical fiction, what I especially like to do is write from the perspective of a person or people who were rendered voiceless in their own time. In the past, a lot of the history as we know it came from a limited point of view, from a certain class or gender and background. So as a feminist Eurasian writer, what I especially like to do when writing my novels is to revisit or rewrite the history we've grown up with, but from the point of view of a woman or Asian people. I like to depict missing dimensions of historical works. What I especially like to do is shift perspectives that have grown out of prior misinformation and prejudice. I've argued before that fiction plays a large part in creating these negative perceptions and representations, but it can play an equally large part in shifting and remaking them. And I also want to write or rewrite stories or histories that haven't fairly represented women or the culturally diverse. I've always thought that this kind of rewriting can actually take the story back to something that's more accurate which is what I've tried to do in my book, which is set in the gold rush, but it's written from the point of view of women and the Chinese. For example, there were more Chinese people on the Palmer River at that time than white people, yet very little has been written about their experience. Mostly the novels about the gold rush are white authored masculine adventure stories. And the Chinese in that period were mostly depicted in books, articles and cartoons as sinister or a threat to white women or white supremacy or as this menacing horde. In, a, in my book, I took the liberty of imagining the lives of a handful of Chinese men and one woman. I wanted to explore how these individuals might have experienced the Palma River in the late 1800s. Also, in writing about the past, I like to tether my historical fiction to issues or themes that are still relevant, such as racism and violence against women. There are still voices that need to be elevated or people who experience voicelessness. In the past year during the pandemic, racism against Asian people here and in the United States has increased 
and I've personally been distressed and angered to see these attacks in the news or on social media. In these times of fear, I wonder if it's more important than ever to remember the individual, the personal, the human rather than the mass. I think that adding to the volume and persistence of voices speaking against racism is worth something in itself. Today, those who were voiceless in the past are not necessarily voiceless any longer, but their voices are still being ignored or elided by the powers that be. This needs to change and hopefully books, both fiction and non-fiction, will continue to shine a light on alternative perspectives and future possibilities. Laura Jean McKay's novel, The Animals in That Country, imagines a zoo flu where those infected with the virus are able to understand animals. Laura wrote her book before our own pandemic, presently enough. So we asked Laura what she thinks animals might tell us about their experience of this pandemic, if they could talk to us. Stand on the rocks and look at the city. It's full of dogs. I start with the words of a dingo, a fictional dingo called Sue, but one who talks. It's hard to know how else to begin a short piece on voicelessness for the Stella Prize. The honour of being here amongst the other shortlistees, Rebecca Giggs, S.L. Lim, Louise Milligan, Marindi Rewo and Evie Wilde has rendered me a little speechless to be honest. So instead, I look at what a dingo might have to say. Dingoes occupy an uncomfortable place in dominant Australian consciousness. We love nothing more than to categorise animals. Introduced, native, feral, wild, pest, predator, pet, keystone, endangered. Dingoes are none and all of these things at once and that's pretty unnerving. The colony's adoration of canines gets shaky when faced with an animal at once wild and attuned to humans. As I cuddled up next to a dingo who was waiting on a dog lead in a wildlife park, I was warned, that's no pet. So I started the animals in that country with, you can see the wild in her. This is the human narrator, Jean, talking. The white woman looking at the dingo and seeing that wild. For seven years, the driving what if question behind the animals in that country was what if the dingo, what if all the animals could talk back? Well, Dingo Sue's personal list for how to be in the world includes the following. Unless others aren't as good, succumb to others. The other can get better quickly, so watch in case it needs to bow. Don't take others' food, others can't take from it. If it eats dogs, be secretive. Encourage each other. Let each other feel all the time. Carry a message with its anus. Pay particular attention to dirt and wind. Enjoy everything. I know. We were hoping for some advice for how to live our lives, for how to combat climate change and global inequality, a hope of note for the future, or some reassurance that we're loved unequivocally by dogs at least. Surely a book of fiction is the chance to finally get animals to say the things we want to hear. But how could I do that to the characters in my novel? How could I do them such a disservice when the only thing I am certain of in terms of this is that if other animals could talk, they would express their umfelt, their life perception, as beings with their own agency. And that has nothing to do with us, except when we encroach on it. The voicelessness of the animals that we share this planet with isn't the problem here. Humans can already talk to each other and where does that get us? Has the very clear and powerful voice of First Nations people been heard by white Australia? Do women have a voice in Parliament? Does the voice of scientists calling for urgent climate change get heard? And so on. Dingoes 
are busy surviving in decreased habitats. A dingo doesn't have time to say this, so I will. In 2021, we need to get a different perspective, to climb a little higher on some rocks perhaps, and to look over the cities, farm, bush and wetlands. Many of the animals are missing, but if we looked past all the people, we can still make out dogs and cows, insects, fish and birds. This is their place too. They say it with their presence. Without them, we will be alone. We need to think about how we can be better people in the world with them. Evie Wilde's novel, The Bass Rock, traverses the legacy of male violence and the ways in which these traumas ripple and reverberate across time and place. Tonight, Evie will share what the woman and the ghosts in her novel might tell us if they could talk. When I started to write The Bass Rock, I had a new baby and so I was writing in between that life really, um, in small moments. And I had fragments here and there and lots of different voices. And there were three that became distinct and that I kept returning to. Um, I wasn't sure how they were connected. There was a woman in the 1950s who was struggling in a suffocating marriage. There was a woman now um, who didn't have any of the things accepted as evidence of a successful life. Um, and then there was a young woman in the 18th century who'd been accused of witchcraft. And there were common threads. There was control by men, there was violences, large and small, and especially the framing of female anger as hysteria, which seemed to connect them all. Um, but it wasn't until I saw Sherelle Moody's Google map of Australian femicide and child death online, um, in which since 2015, she's been marking the deaths of women and children um, through violence and neglect that something clicked and it became clear that this was one story. Um, there's a, a continent covered in markers in which she's tracked the gender of the victim and the perpetrator in what seemed to me to echo those maps and films about serial killers um, when suddenly disparate crimes become the work of one killer. And I asked myself the question, what if every woman ever killed by a man was put on a map like this? As soon as I'd had the thought, I imagined a voice saying, not all men. Um, and I had a feeling that I was making a fuss, that I was exaggerating, um, that it would make men feel uncomfortable, it would make women feel uncomfortable. After all, aren't they the mothers of sons and wives to husbands and daughters of fathers? Um, and I thought, how reductive, how negative, what a harpy I am. Um, and that was when I knew it was a novel I really wanted to write. It made sense for me of so many things that I'd never allowed myself to look fully in the eye. Because the conditions which have allowed men to hurt women again and again are the conditions that we've grown up in. Suddenly, a man telling a woman to cheer up love or making a joke about her being on her period was the same tone of voice that a witch finder used. I could hear the weary resignation, that faux concern with which a husband had his wife institutionalised for responding to the confines of her position in all of the men who've ever talked over me as if I wasn't there. All of the voices internal and external telling us that we're too loud, too quiet, too sexy, not sexy enough, too big, too serious, not cheerful, too much a body forcing men to look at us with that mixture of desire and hatred. The million ways in which girls are taught that their needs, their rights and their safety are less important than the comfort of a man, that their bodies are not their bodies, but a kind of resource that must be removed from circulation. The rape and murder are the natural and logical consequence of this resource left improperly tended. That the responsibility and solution for men hurting women, men hurting children and men hurting men does not somehow lie with men. That it's women who must change how they dress, how they talk, 
where they walk and when. The same casual assumption that we will make that the sandwiches will bear the children and buy the birthday presents. How different the world must feel to those of us who have walked home with their keys poking out from their fists and those of us who haven't. How innocent it must seem to those who do not have to make the avoidance of death part of their to-do list. This felt like a story that these women were part of, that I was part of, that countless unvoiced women are part of. The novel came out of an attempt to reclaim these women's hopes and cares and lives as being fundamentally of value, of mattering more than the comfort of men, of mattering more ultimately through the discomfort of men. What I wanted to do was to suggest that somehow within this narrative there is hope, that somewhere in the shared experience between women, there is solidarity and there's strength and there's laughter and sisterhood and life. There is the potential for men and women to survive the damage that men do to us and to each other and to themselves. S.L. Lim's psychological thriller, Revenge, Murder in Three Parts, brings to vivid life the frustrations of a talented daughter born in the wrong time and place. We asked SL to tell us how the character's life might have been different if she hadn't been stripped of her voice so young. I want to talk about this idea of voice and what it does and what it doesn't do through a lens of my novel, Revenge, Murder in Three Parts. The protagonist, Yanni, is this person with this great capacity for desire. She wants love, sex and art and adventure. And she's also poor and queer and she's born on the wrong side of the border. And so she is denied the scope to enact her capacity for desire. And I think one really important thing is that in universe, Yanni absolutely has a voice and knows how to use it. She understands what is happening to her and she can articulate that very sharply. And this doesn't really help her very much. And this is a recognition that she has as a character very early on. You can be smarter than everyone. You can be more passionate. You can even be right. That doesn't really do much when someone else has power and you don't. And that, I think, is quite a good jumping off point to talk about this relationship between voice and power, about which there are so many sayings, speaking truth to power, holding power to account, as if this, to be blunt, does something, and it doesn't. It just doesn't. And we see it in so many instances. You can think of Australian and global movements against police. And in so many cases, we have an account you can watch the video, you can see a cop throttle a woman, you can watch a cop slam an indigenous kid to the ground or steal their bike for no reason, you know, it's absolute cartoon villain stuff. And we know what happened, we have the story, and yet this does not result in consequences either for the individual or for the system of policing which deploys violence on behalf of state and capital insofar as these things are even distinct. And I think there is an important point to be made here, which is that voice is premised on accountability and accountability is premised on some baseline of mutuality and shared values, which does not exist with any number of institutions that are fundamentally oppressive. And I think the really important thing here to remember is that oppression by and large does not occur by mistake. No one stepped on a rake and accidentally did a genocide. They did it because it benefits someone's material interest for that to occur. And here I am defining the material as something which has an effect on the world, which is observable from the outside. It's not just about our subjective perception and feeling and experience. It is something which you can see its effects from the outside. And so this idea of speaking truth to power in cases where there is material oppression and a material incentive for that oppression to occur really becomes at best kind of a waste of time and at worst this cynical vortex into which 
all kinds of resources get sucked and you get absolutely nothing in return. So the question which this begs is really, why bother to read and why bother to write? Because I can tell, you know, that there can be something a little bit disingenuous about going all, you know, lol, why use your voice? And an event which is about books, which by definition is kind of listening to someone else's voice for a very, very long time. And the response I would have to that is that everything doesn't really need to be for something that kind of takes you to a turtles all the way down type situation. I think people should make art and write books and read books and enjoy that because they want to. It's an underrated motivation. If it brings us joy, we should do it. That's really a principle to be applied in more parts of life than just books. But since we're having this conversation, I do want to talk a little bit about the role that art and voice can play in a politics of liberation. That is obviously an absolutely huge question and not one that I'm going to answer today and here. But really, there are two things that I have to say. The first being that if oppression is material, then resistance to oppression also needs to be grounded in the material. And how we feel about the world and how we feel about ourselves and how we think about the world and ourselves, it is material in that it exists in the world and it can lead to consequences in what we do, which are not solely interior. The other thing I'd like to say about the saying, speaking truth to power, the thing that challenges power isn't truth. The thing that challenges power is power. And so if there is a function for art in this domain, it is in articulating the kinds of power we want to build and the ways we can build it. Investigative journalist Louise Milligan's book, Witness, charts the experience of sexual abuse victims who seek justice in Australian courts. Tonight, Louise will detail just how often victims of sexual assault are denied their voice on the witness stand and re-traumatised, and what needs to change. I was so pleased when I found out that the theme of this year's Stella Prize is on voice and voicelessness. We've seen over the past couple of months women in particular regaining their voices, people who were voiceless actually having the courage to come forward and tell their stories. Um, Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame are really, really good examples of that. Uh, and, and women marching in the streets and saying, this is not okay. We are not going to accept these types of violent crimes and sexual harassment anymore. Something needs to change. Now, the sorts of conversations that we're having at the moment are the very reason that I wrote Witness in the first place, because what I wanted to expose was what happens to these people when they actually take that next step and enter the criminal justice system. What happens to them when they are cross-examined by defence counsel? What sort of protections do they have? How does it leave them feeling? And what I found when I spoke to a lot of uh, victims and complainants, and when I read the research from Royal Commissions and uh, Law Reform Commissions and Parliamentary Inquiries and so on, was that typically, uh, these people who come before the courts will often say that the experience of being cross-examined, the experience of, ex of going through the criminal justice system was as bad, if not worse, than the original crime that they experienced. Um, this is something that's also routinely said to psychologists who counsel these people. And of course, they said it to me many times. And this included people who had convictions in their cases. So it was seen as a, a win that they got this conviction. But they came away from it so bruised and so re-traumatised that they wondered whether it was actually worth it after all. Now, the consequence of this, if, if 
this message gets out that it's not worth it after all, and if we don't protect these people better, is that perpetrators of sexual crimes against women and children get away with it. And that's something that I think that we really need to address. The presumption of innocence is absolutely vital to our criminal justice system. It must be protected. But I don't think that we ought to sacrifice the victim in order to give the accused perpetrator the presumption of innocence. The victim shouldn't feel as if they are on trial. The complainant shouldn't feel as if they are on trial just because we want to safeguard the presumption of innocence. And there are lots of things that I look at in witness that are potential solutions um, for protecting these people better. I hope that the huge focus that we have right now on this issue, particularly on the gendered aspect of this issue, will lead to these sorts of conversations. And I hope that people reading Witness will lead to people in the criminal justice system, lawyers, judges, um, policy makers, thinking about how we can do this better. Because it's not fair to ask people to take this enormous leap of faith and not to look after them, not to protect them in the process. I thank the Stella Prize f so much for being shortlisted for this prize. It's such an honour, but it's also an opportunity for me to be able to further spread this message, which I think is vitally important. As a journalist, I want to give a voice to the voiceless. I want to shine light in dark places. And Witness is another example of me trying to do that. And I hope you all read it and thank you so much. Rebecca Giggs' non-fiction focuses on how people feel about and feel for animals in a time of technological change and ecological crisis. Fathoms, The World in the Whale is her first book. Please welcome Rebecca Giggs. Late in 2020, I wrote a piece for The Guardian about listening to bird calls during the COVID-19 lockdowns. It seemed to me that many more of my neighbours had begun paying attention to local bird life and to the sounds of birds. But more than that, that the significance of these sounds was shifting in response to the crisis. The reasons why birdsong mattered to people were not as had been the case before. What we go to nature to hear, what we go to nature to receive, changes. There was, of course, something really heartening about the clarity with which birds could now be heard because traffic noise had been abated and the hubbub of manufacturing had fallen away. The bird, birds' voices came into the foreground and bioacousticians said that because they could hear over long di longer distances, they were chorusing with much further flung counterparts, far off birds that had been drowned out by the sounds of motorways or um, by regions of industry. So each bird's awareness of other, other birds was expanding and the voices of potential companions, adversaries, mates, whole flocks, could be heard in distant trees and over distant horizons. What peace there was to be had for a human listener listening to birds during this season drew from the same recovery narrative, an idea of nature left alone, heedful only of itself, recuperating. But bird calls also offered a means for us to get out of our own heads. It was as though we were looking for a place from which we might then view our own troubles as small and fleeting and limited, as from the bird's eye perspective. What we wanted from birdsong was a kind of trapdoor, a mental escape from the emergency of the moment. Animals are not voiceless, but we grant them different kinds of legibility according to whether we think that they're social beings, whether we see them as creatures with an inner life 
or if they're just a kind of drowsy soundtrack, white noise in the background. In researching my book Fathoms, which is shortlisted for this year's Stella Prize, I learned that though whales have a vast vocal repertoire, people didn't grow enchanted with the sounds that we now call whale songs until they were the whales were nearly extinct. They were on the threshold of disappearance, having been hunted nearly to oblivion. So the original intrigue of whale song lay in the fact that it was simply becoming harder to hear. It might have been the first time that we considered that it would be possible to hear the global extinction taking place. Now, thankfully, whale populations have rebounded since then, but whale voices are still changing. Since the 1960s, the sound of the blue whale has dropped three white notes in pitch on a piano, the equivalent of three white notes, and they've also grown quieter. This may be because of the um, changes, chemical changes in the ocean. The ocean is becoming slightly more acidic as a result of global warming. And because sound waves carry further in an ocean like that, the whales don't need to be so loud. That being said, when the Antarctic summer starts and the ice starts to break up, um, it's a longer and hotter austral summer now, whales are increasingly needing to shout again to hear one another. They're altering their voices in places humans never go, where there are no ships, um, because of the changing conditions of the planet. I thought a lot about writing and thinking about silence in when I was working on Fathoms. And in particular, I thought about how silence is so often the solace of nature. The minutes pause that fills with the sounds of the breeze in the grass or snowfalls plump aerospace, the droning of insects are fluttering in the hedge. If you listen where you are now, you probably can hear an animal, whether it's a crow or a kurawong a mosquito, maybe the dog's claws on the paving. Silence is full of natural sound, at least at the silence that refreshes us is. And increasingly, I think that we need that to be able to tune in to our inner voices, to hear our true ambitions, our confessions, our inconsistencies and our daring. And maybe too, like the birds during the lockdown, we may discover that we are more legion than we knew before, when what was between us was all noise. Thank you to this year's Stella's Prize for helping us to hear one another. Well, an incredible short list of authors that we have. Thank you, all of you, for your thoughtful and powerful words. And congratulations once again. And with all that, we have finally reached the moment that we've all been waiting for. To make the announcement, it's my great pleasure to hand over to the Chair of the 2021 Judges, author and editor, Zoya Patel. On behalf of my fellow judges, I am really excited to announce the winner of the 2021 Stella Prize is The Bass Rock by E.B. Wilde. Congratulations, E.B. This novel absolutely stood out as just a feat of literary technique. Wilde's writing is bold and experimental, and she brings to life this story of um, women's experiences throughout generations um, with just a depth and an insight that is truly a pleasure to read. So I highly recommend everyone get a hold of this wonderful book. And again, congratulations, Evie, what an incredible achievement. I would be grateful for this award in any context, to be in the company of writers as talented as the short list and the long list has been a massive privilege and there's a huge amount to be learnt from their books as well as a huge amount of enjoyment to be had. So I'd like to thank them um, and I'd like to thank my publishers around the world, my literary agent and most of all the team at Stella for providing this space for women and non-binary writers work to be seen and celebrated. And in the context of this last year, in which lockdown and homeschool conspired to squeeze every last second of time, this award feels like an especially welcome validation. I started writing The Bass Rock in a pre-Me Too world, and now I'm talking about it in a post-Covid one. 
The pandemic feels like an experiment in how much women can be forced to absorb as they take on the majority of unpaid work and childcare during lockdown. Globally, domestic abuse cases rose dramatically. Last month here in the UK, as lockdown protocols began to loosen, a young woman called Sarah Everard was murdered as she walked home and in the public conversation around female safety and their experience of, of sexual violence, the hashtag not all men resurfaced. When I first thought about writing this book in which the central idea was that all of the violence ever committed against women was committed by the same malign presence, I thought it would have to be a high concept, speculative, full of magic and monsters sort of novel. But as I wrote it, I came to see that the power of this story came from the threads that bound these three women in their common experience. The problem is that it's not a monster, it's part of the fabric of everything. The poisonous narratives that lead women to believe that their safety is worth less than male dignity begin with the messages we send about what sort of work matters that male work does matter, that female work does not. This prize continues to say loudly that the work of women and non-binary writers matter. And for that, I am extremely grateful. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Evie, fantastic result. We're sending you our warmest love and congratulations from Australia and hope that you're keeping safe and well in the UK. Well, tonight we've heard from writers at the top of their game about voice and voicelessness. The Bass Rock is a fearless novel that gives voice to the spirits of wronged girls and women across time and reminds us of the saving grace of sisterhood. Evie will be in conversation with Elizabeth McCarthy next week. You can find out all the details via the Wheeler Centre website. Congratulations once again to all of the 2021 Stella authors. If you're a bit late to your Stella reading this year, you can pick up a copy of The Bass Rock or any of the other books that you've heard about tonight from independent bookstores or your library. Well, to close this evening, we are delighted to have Emma Donovan and The Putbacks performing Yarian Michi off their new album Crossover, sung in the South Australian language of Naranjiri, and this song was written by the late Auntie Ruby Hunter, and it translates to What Is My Story? Thank you to the Stella Prize for inviting me to host this evening. It's been an honour to celebrate the power of storytelling with you all. Thanks for joining us here at Emma Donovan and the Putbacks. It's a beautiful song by our lovely Auntie Ruby Hunter. The song's called Yari and Michi.
Yeah, yeah, me teach you.